suggest we make a start as people hopefully join us from the corridors. I think we're sufficiently behind schedule to begin. So um, we've got a very packed panel, and I'm uh, very much looking forward to a panel called Actors, Communication and Narratives. Before I introduce the speaker, I just wanted to remind all of the speakers that we've got a 150-minute panel with five papers. Um, I was told that each paper has 20 minutes for presentation. That makes it 100 minutes of presentation, 100 minutes for you to listen, and then comes the discussant. In other words, what I want to say is be very disciplined, be provocative, be sharp in your thesis so that we don't um, have an audience falling asleep after the wonderful lunch that we all had. But I'm sure that that won't be a problem. So we'll start right away. Um, first presentation um, is from Krzysztof Wasilewski from Koszalin University of Technology. And he's going to give a presentation entitled Cross-Border Politics of Memory, Definition, Actors and Actions. Um, Krzysztof has been on numerous international fellowships across several European countries, I saw, um, has published widely, uh, started off with the issue of neoconservatism in American foreign policy, has then come to research Polish national press, um, and is now, as we all are, interested in questions of memorialization, in particular through the perspective of the media fr and the frames that the media develops. Um, he's a member of the Faculty of Humanities at the Technical University of Koszalin and I would say the floor is yours, Christoph. Thank You've you. got about 20 minutes. I'll be ruthless okay. with the timing. I will try not to. Uh, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure to speak in front of such public. I'm glad I'm the first, so the probability that the public will fall asleep is the least now. Hopefully. Uh, okay, um, the topic of my presentation is cross-border politics of memory, definition, actors, and actions. Uh, I'm very happy that I can share some of my research with you. I come from uh, Koszalin. I represent Koszalin University of Technology, which is uh, part of uh, so-called Western territories, uh, Western Northern territories of Poland. That is the territories that were absorbed into the Polish state in 1945. So the uh, idea of cross-border uh, contacts of borderlands is very close to, to me from the very uh, idea that I live there, but it's been a topic that I've been trying to research quite for quite a, uh, some time now. Uh, my presentation will be first and foremost theoretical in scope, but I try to include some case studies to present uh, the, the, the theoretical framework, but I will start from, from theory. Uh, uh, as it has already been said, I've been interested in the media and the media role in uh, memory and collective memory and politics of memory. So this is why I have chosen for a theoretical framework uh, two concepts that, uh, in my opinion, fit the most uh, my interest in the media, that is politics of memory as part of social theory of international relations, but uh, even more important, uh, to I propose to analyze international scope of uh, politics of memory within cross-culture communication theory, uh, since uh, politics of memory is uh, first and foremost about discourse, and discourse is about communication, and international politics of memory is about communication between two or more groups from different ethnicities, cultures, and so on, then, in my opinion, cross-cultural communication is the right theoretical framework to try to analyze uh, politics of memory, at least in its international uh, aspects. Here you can see some of the basic uh, information about these two concepts, that is social theory of international politics and cross-cultural communication. I guess this, most of them are known for, for you, so I will move uh, further. Uh, so in cross-cultural communication uh, perspective of international relations, conflict does not mean collision of various forces. Fortunately, we don't speak about wars staged uh, like war in the in Ukraine between uh, as a, like a Russian attack on Ukraine we are speaking about 
uh, conflicts in uh, the disc in discourse. Uh, so these conflicts are most uh, mostly take place in the communication aspect. That this is why. Uh, as we, you can see here, conflict is always a dispute of the minds and will of the parties involved, as the social theory of international relations says. Uh, it's not just this hard power, it's soft power that matters in international relations and our culture or uh, values which collide uh, in the sphere of uh, politics of memory as well, they are very important. Uh, as I said, I will focus on uh, Polish-German borderland, but uh, for me, borderland is not just the territory that is close to the uh, political border between Poland and Germany, for example. As I said before, it's, I, treat, I consider borderland all the western and northern territories of Poland that were uh, incorporated into the Polish state in 1945, uh, because uh, the heritage that people uh, meet there, that see that uh, is uh, multicultural, uh, even the ethnic uh, 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 the, the ethnic groups that live there are uh, more ethnically diverse than in the rest of the country. This is why, in my opinion, we should treat um, western and northern parts of Poland as borderlands as a whole, not just borderland cities, which are the, the main actor of uh, cross-border politics of memory, but also those cities and other uh, territories that are uh, that used to be German now are Polish. Uh, so this uh, cross-culture communication takes place uh, on everyday basis there. Uh, yeah, so uh, if we are to define cross-border politics of memory, first we should define cross-border politics in general. And it is surprising, surprisingly very few definitions of cross-border politics are available in Polish and in foreign literature. Uh, at least I, I couldn't find uh, a a broad literature on the topic. Uh, so uh, I just uh, quoted here uh, from one book and uh, the definition that cross-border politics is a complex array of programs, policies, and imaginaries of political community which, in which borders are used as resources for different specific aims. And what, what is important, cross-border cooperation is a prominent instrument of many border politics. That is, cross-border politics is about cooperation and dialogue. Uh, so uh, just like cross-cultural communication should lead to dialogue, so is cross-border politics. And uh, we, should, we can define cross-border politics of memory, memory within this theoretical scope of cross-border politics and cross-cultural cross communication. Here I quote Hans Henning Hahn. I think he's the most uh, known uh, political scientist and historian, at least in, in, in Polish literature, and his definition of this cross-border politics is the most known, the most popular. Uh, so in his opinion, cross-border politics of memory is a discursive event that is an accident in which someone tries to participate in the identity discourse of another society. I think this, th th this sentence is the most important one here because uh, whereas uh, international politics is about communication between states, official institutions and so on, uh, when we talk about cross-border politics of memory, it's about uh, communication between state and, and a society, society and a society or unofficial actors and unofficial actors. So we must include society as a whole as a recipient of cross-border politics of memory. Uh, here is some uh, to remind the stages of cross-cultural communication from denial through defense, minimization, acceptance, adaptation, integration, and retreat. And this is important to, to, to keep in mind when we analyze politics of memory uh, from the perspective of, of cross-cultural communication because if we want uh, cross-border politics of memory to succeed, uh, we must uh, achieve uh, at least the stage of acceptance uh, to, in order that this politics of memory uh, is successful. When, when there is denial, and I will try to show you uh, a case study where there is a denial or defense, the politics of memory does not work. At least the society to which this politics of memory is directed uh, is not responsive to it. 
so what 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 is else uh, important to remember is that cross border politics of memory uh, in cross border politics of memory all resources are allocated very unequally so disputes taking place through them do not follow the rules of fair play so the 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 actor which dominates the discourse uh, has the most to say uh, of course, it's, it doesn't mean that the, the strongest actor, for example, nation state, is the most powerful in discourse. It can be uh, another uh, subject of discourse which is more powerful than official institutions of uh, nation states, for example. We, we have seen examples of, uh, of such, an, uh, such a case when, when the government, the central government, uh, loses this uh, discursive conflict uh, with uh, with other actors, for example, with uh, self-governments of different countries. Okay, so let's take a look now uh, at actors of cross-border politics. Uh, in my opinion, we can uh, list at least uh, this number of actors: central government, meaning also central institutions, local government, and local institutions such as museums, libraries, uh, and other institutions that are funded by uh, local governments, non-governmental organizations, uh, cross-border organizations, churches, and individuals. Uh, and here I, here I underline media because, I, in my opinion, media are not an independent actor of cross-border politics of memory or politics of memory as such. Uh, if we treat politics of memory as discourse, uh, media only provide platform for different from different ideas presented by other actors. Media do not do, are not should not be considered, in my opinion, as an independent actor of politics of memory. And uh, so it should be also pointed out that in cross-border politics of memory, the position of central and local institutions is often questioned by unofficial actors, even individuals at this very local level. Uh, when we uh, when we talk about uh, cities or uh, or re regions, lo uh, uh, individuals have uh, an impact on what local government does in uh, in uh, politics of uh, memory. And, and here is a model of uh, how uh, politics of memory, or cross-border politics of memory, is uh, constructed. Here I uh, use a cascading network activation uh, model from Robert Antman. Who, who established such a model in, in, to, to, to analyze uh, media frames in this course. And I think we can uh, use the same uh, model to, to, to see how in politics of memory is constructed. Uh, as you can see, central government, th th this arrow from central government to local government and uh, down is only one way. There is, mm, it's very hard to, to, to find an example when local government or other institutions from, 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 um, from lower, le lower levels can influence central government. But on the, other, on the other hand, if we take a look at the, the, the model of cross-border cross uh, politics of memory, we can see that central government uh, has very little impact on what happens on, on the other side of the border. Uh, because uh, central government is interested in, in communication with other central governments or central institutions. Here we, we can s see that the, the, the role of local institutions, of individual acti heritage in activists, for example, of local governments, NGOs and churches is much uh, stronger and uh, much more responsive to, to societies to which this uh, these uh, politics of memories are uh, directed to. Uh, because uh, let, let me remind you that we that, 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 that here uh, politics of memories uh, is a discourse. So so here we 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 treat these uh, actors as subjects of discourse, and it is difficult to, to measure the the strength of each uh, individual actor, such as local government, ch church, or NGOs, or individual activists, uh, as a general. But uh, I will try to to show you uh, three case uh, case studies which uh, hopefully will uh, try to present this model in a more empirical way. 
So one case study is from my city of Koshalin, which I represent. It's a memorial plaque of Berta von Masov. Uh, she was uh, a founder of a uh, hospital in Koshalin prior to 1945, so we are speaking about so-called German times in the history of the city. And in October 2021, uh, this plague was, uh, was uh, uh, established at the Koshalin Regional Hospital. Uh, so a year ago, uh, this ceremony took place. And what is important is that the idea to, to fund such a, such a memorial site, we can call it a memorial site or a site of memory, uh, originated in uh, local NGOs, in uh, NGOs uh, that works in Poland. Then uh, churches became interested in that idea. And finally, uh, NGOs and churches managed to interest with this idea the local government. So uh, when we uh, talk about the final stage of this uh, action, this, this example of politics of memory, we can see that all the actors were included, but, but the idea started from the very mm, down level, from the individuals and NGOs which were able to, to, to uh, uh, to make a local government uh, do what they wanted. Uh, uh, when we analyze why it happens, because it, it's very often the case that, uh, that uh, non-governmental uh, organizations or individuals are able to, to influence local governments to, 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 to act in, in, in the field of politics of memory uh, the way they want. They want. Uh, it's first and foremost because there are no professional uh, employees of local governments who would be responsible for politics of memory. Uh, if you, uh, at least in, Pol in, in Poland, uh, the, the, the constitution and uh, the law does not give uh, local governments a, a very wide uh, space for performing politics of memory. It's mostly done unofficially. Uh, this is why these unofficial actors uh, have stronger role in politics of memory, at least at this local level, than official ones. So this is one of case study, and uh, and when we look at it from the perspective of uh, cross-cultural communication, we see that here we have a dialogue between the German side and the Polish side. Uh, Berta von Maso, she, she is not a controversial, controversial figure, so there were no controversies uh, whatsoever in, in, in funding such a plague. Uh, officials from, uh, from uh, the hospital, from local governments, and from the representatives of the Vojevoda uh, um, office were, uh, were uh, present during the, the event, so uh, it, it was no controversial. This is why this, this could be descended in uh, success. Another case study is a uh, Voldenberg prisoner, uh, prisoner of war camp uh, located in, in present Dobiegniew near uh, Gorzu Wielkopolski, uh, which uh, used, is a museum, is still a museum, but uh, it was in a very uh, bad state. But due to the, uh, uh, due to some uh, transborder cooperation, interreg cooperation program, it was able, uh, the officials were able to, uh, to, to reconstruct it and, uh, and to make it a museum of the 21st century. Uh, as you can see, it was done uh, again between, with the cooperation of the Polish and German institutions here at the official level. Uh, between the, the Begnev authorities and Verein Phantom uh, in Berlin. It's a non-governmental institution in Berlin. Uh, which uh, was a, a German partner uh, of the Dobigniew authorities and, uh, and uh, last year it was opened as a new museum of prisoners of war camp. So it's another success, success story when we think uh, from the perspective of cross-border politics of memory. First and foremost because it's, and again, not a controversial issue. It's, a, it's, a, it's not a concentration camp, it's not a death uh, camp, it's, it's a prisoner of war camp which uh, by both sides were not, it's not regarded as a place of terror. Of course was, um, people died there and so on, but in a, from the perspective of both societies it was not a controversial issue. This is why uh, this, uh, this, this could happen and, and the museum could be open with 
uh, with materials in Polish and German. Uh, so ger German tourists, for example, could come and visit. And another case study, uh, monument of the Polish victims. This is the case study which shows that when there is no, uh, when we don't reach this one of these levels in, in, in cross-cultural communication, the politics of memory does not work uh, in its international aspect. And this is one of such a case. This is a monument of the Polish victims, which. Uh, uh, it's in the fifth year of, of the project uh, in 2017. Uh, some of uh, German uh, officials or former officials uh, started the idea that Polish victims of the German occupation so should be commemorated in Berlin. Uh, uh, last year, uh, former German uh, foreign minister Heiko Maas uh, presented an, an idea of site of memory in meetings with Poland. However, uh, we are in 2022 and in the end, and this idea has not materialized so far. So why, uh, if we analyze, uh, of course there were s several reasons and uh, uh, I wouldn't be able to mention them all, but if we analyze this example of cross border politics of memory because we can treat it as a cross-border politics of memory. We can see that this, uh, okay, that this level of, uh, of uh, cross-cultural communication has not been reached in order to, to, to be successful. Like in these former two cases, uh, we have uh, an understanding from both sides um, and a dialogue here, uh, it seems that this stage has not been uh, reached so far. Okay, so this is all from me, thank you. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Christoph. And just for kind of procedural information, we'll take each of the presentations, then give it to the discussant, and then you can all um, share your questions, so please keep them all in mind. Um, second presentation is from a person that probably doesn't really need an introduction, but nevertheless, um, Rafał Rogulski from ENRS is going to present um, about ENRS as an example of conducting politics of memory. Just as a reminder, Rafał um, studied at the universities of Wrocław and in Marburg, Germany, and he's had a successful career in politics before he was tasked with creating and management of the ENRS Secretariat in 2010, which then became the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity in 2015. And I'm sure we'll hear much more about this just now. Thank you. I never met the career in the politics, but um, <laughs> I was only <laughs> an assistant or an advisor <laughs> of the foreign minister. That qualified for me. Well, this was Bartoszewski, but, <laughs> but never the politician. Okay, I would like to present to you an outline of a project aimed uh, at political academic reflection on international historical policy. That is historical policy implemented in an international environment on the example of the initiative called the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, ENRS. I will focus mainly on presenting the processes that led to the establishment of the ENRS, then creating its program and setting up international cooperation. Mm, I will start with a short introduction and try to answer the question why this topic is worth um, reflecting on. Historical policies, in the meaning that uh, researchers such as Edgar Wolfrum, Marek Cichocki, Jan Riedel or Klaus Legevi apply as one of the policies pursued by states was often described in relation to one state, German, Hungarian or Polish, um, or as a phenomenon without specific national context. However, their international historical policy unless it considered postulating its, its emergence and development, has been rarely discussed as it is a relatively new phenomenon. And inst institutions operating in this area began to emerge at the beginning of the uh, 21st century. Before, there were mainly bilateral uh, undertakings like joint textbooks commissions, Franco-German, Polish-German, German-Israeli, Czech-German textbook commissions, or quite promising but not really successful Polish-Russian group for difficult issues. However, 
all these undertakings can be included in the category of tools which serve the foreign historical policy of the participating states. All of them had a very practical goal, to support the dialogue on the history of mutual relations and deepen the knowledge about each other, those building understanding, mutual respect, and peaceful future. Before I list the multi-international institutions, I just want to mention that thanks to the development of research on historical memory and cultures um, of memory, research projects and bilateral works have emerged relating to memorial sites of two nations, German, French or Polish German memorial sites, this, that one edited by Professor Robert Traba and Professor Hans Henning Hahn. These works, however, did not deal with the organizational infrastructure of historical policies, but rather with places or of remembrance um, themselves in reference to Pierre Nora concept and above all, its creative developments by Etienne Francois and Hagen Schulz as well as by Moritz Czaki. At the beginning of the 20, uh, 21st century, several uh, international initiatives appeared which in the international environment implement projects disseminating knowledge about the history of 20th century. In 2005, the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity, 2011, association called the Platform of European Memory and Conscience, um, and 2012 European Memory Observatory uh, in, in Barcelona. And now I will focus on the European Network Remembrance and Solidarity uh, born processes. The European Network was born out of conflict. Representatives of the world of politics, the media and academia took part in the stormy debates uh, that took place in Central Europe at the turn of the 20th and 21st century centuries and were mainly uh, countered around the memory of the Second World War and its consequences. A large part of the debate concerned Polish-German relations, but already then it was clear that the problems were of a much broader nature and involved the entire region of Central and Eastern Europe, including Germany, and uh, to a varying extent, to varying extent, other European or even non-European countries. The dispute was sparked by uh, sparked off by uh, resolution of the German Bundestag of the. 29th May 1989, which among other things expressed the expectations that persons referred to as German ex-police would in future be able to settle in the territories from which they had been expelled, which now included Poland and the Czech Republic. A further point of contention was the demand by the Federation of Expellees, a German organization which brought together most of the local compatriots associations for an institution to be set in Berlin, founded by the federal government to commemorate the suffering the German population resettled from the former Eastern borderlands to the Third Reich. The concept for this institution, which was originally to be called the center of expellees, only allowed room for reflection on the, th on the uh, time after 1945 and the fate of the Germans as victims of the Second World War. There, were, there was a lack of context, a lack of team between the years 1933, 83, uh, especially 19. 93 and 1945 and beyond. This was due to the interpretative doctrine applied by the German Federation of Expellees, which separated effects from the causes and was based on the promise that one 
of the premise that uh, one uh, lawlessness could not justify another. That assumption allowed uh, a large part of ex-police and their supporters um, the comfort of concentrating on commemorating their own victims without feeling any shared responsibility for they, their fate because they rejected the claim that it the Germans then that if the Germans had not started the Second World War and committed countless uh, atrocities, the borders would not have been redrawn and the consequent transfer of millions of people from East and West wouldn't not have happened. Both events, the Bundestag Reso resolution and the plan to build the center for ex police were a cold shower for all those in Europe, especially in Central um, Europe, who had hoped that the processes of reconciliation between Poles and Germans or between Czechs and Germans would run smoothly and uh, that the deba debatable historical issues would uh, in principle have already been clarified. A broad international discussion began involving a number of themes. The Polish same responded the Bundestag resolution with a statement um, on the 3rd July 1989, in which among other things, it negatively assessed the significance of the resolution of the, of, for Polish-German relationships and emphasized the common uh, 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 responsibility for lasting peaceful cooperation between nations, quotation. In the following years, the media in the countries um, of the region were flooded with articles and interviews with experts. There were official and unofficial talks in all possible diplomatic and non-diplomatic forums. Various ideas were put forward about how to deal with the problems arising from different historical sensitivities and memories of both totalitarianism and their consequences, as well as with manipulation of history for short-term uh, political ends. Irrespective um, of the um, appraisals expressed and solutions proposed, it was pointed out increasingly often that there was a need for an international dialogue on history, especially on the 20th century history, because otherwise the bonds with which were supposed to unite the community of Europeans and their nations would be fragile and non-sustainable. Uh, the international debate was accompanied and often determined uh, by domestic discussing, discussions on dealing with one's uh, own past as well as by different concepts of how to talk about one's own history abroad. In the most general terms, um, mm, this was mm, the situation which formed the context uh, for the many months of negotiations that began in 2003 by res representatives of the ministries of culture or their uh, equivalents of six Central European states, Austria, the Czech Republic, Germany, Poland, Slovakia, and Hungary. They ended in February 2005 with the signing of a declaration of intent to establish a European network, remembrance and solidarity. In the end, only the ministers of the last four countries signed the document, while Austria and Czech Republic opted merely for sending their representatives to the advisory assemblies of the new initiative. The reasons for signing or not signing the 2005 declaration varied between the signatures, but in the background, of course, there were usually intentions to achieve some more or less defined political goals. These objectives, especially 
in the initial period were modified as government changed in individual member countries, which made it very difficult to kick start the network's activities. At the same time, however, its um, undefined legal status allowed the initiative to survive until all parties were ready to take adequate action. This happened at the turn of 2009 and 2010 when uh, the Tomasz Merta and the Secretary of State of, in the Ministry of um, Culture and National Heritage of Poland and Andrzej Przewoźnik, the first Polish coordinator of the network um, and the main negotiator of this 2005 declaration, supported by Professor Matthias Weber and Professor Attila Pock, Mm, uh, Germans and Hungarian coordinator uh, decided to try to implement its provisions. According to the structure of the network specified in the declaration, members of advisory assemblies, the academic council and the advisory board were appointed while the national coordinators formed the steering committee, so decision-making body. The first meeting of the members of these bodies was held in Warsaw in February 2010. And in April, uh, in, uh, the setting up uh, of the NRS Secretariat began. Uh, this, is, th this is where mm, the first issue emerge, emerges that uh, the implement, implement implementers of the notions of the NRS were and are still struggling with the legal and organizational status of the project or how to act as an international organization without actually from the legal point of view being one. According to the provisions of the declaration of the network's members are states, net, uh, of, of the declaration, the network's members are states, and it is they that primarily finance the activities, but a joint declaration does not yet set up the legal framework of the international organization and the related obligations. This could be written down in an international agreement, which would have to be negotiated and in advance and go through a complicated process of governmental and parliamentary approval in each of the signator signatory states. To date, the members' uh, state of the network, joined by Romania in uh, 2014, uh, have not decided to, to carry out this, this way. This has not uh, diminished their willingness to cooperate in the implementation of the network's tasks expressed in the form of regular financial support. Thus, the main task of the ENRS Secretariat was and still is to develop and continuously, continuously improve an organizational formula, formula that would allow the creation consultation and delivery of projects whose founding come from multiple sources and involves hetero he heterogeneous, sometimes contradictory requirements. With the good will of all parties, it is possible, as evidenced by the delivery of about 200 projects between 2010 and 2022, Yet, it requires great flexibility and acceptance of the unstable nature of almost all processes related to the founding of the network. In this sense, ENRS combines... Mm -hmm. It combines the features of an international institution with the functioning of the non-governmental organization. It is certainly a highly imperfect formula, but it allows the governments of the member countries of the network to flexibly support joint projects in the sphere of foreign policy, of remembrance, with no permanent formal obligations.
um, the phenomenon of the INRS, the first such institution in Europe, should be perceived uh, on two levels. First, the substantial level where difficult, often painful historical issues become the subject of projects carried out in an international group and in cooperation with other institutions. Secondly, the organizational level, because the INRS operates in the way um, a non-governmental institutions does, while simultaneously being public institution, whose budget consists from found from funds from five countries plus those raised from other sources, for example, from the EU or Visegrad Fund. And here, finally, we come to another important concept, innovation, which in relation to the NRS has three dimension, di dimensions. Uh, a flexible way of management combining the governmental and non-governmental spheres. A wide range of international projects, scientific, educational, and networking ones. And the objective of supporting other institutions in establishing and effecting cooperation with those from other countries. Historical policy pursued in an international environment must um, inevitably bring the cooperating parties closer in terms of organizational and substantive matters, which in turn makes it difficult to um, unilaterally uh, control the discourse mentioned by Professor Bata Ociepka when writing about historical diplomacy, foreign historical policy. The implementation of joint international projects within common international institutions differs slightly from the foreign historical policy pursued by one party, although in a broader sense it may be understood as one of the elements of the state's foreign policy. However, it requires dialogue and mutual understanding or at least listening to each other, hearing the other party's message and finding the common ground that, it, uh, that is acceptable for everyone. In democratic countries, this is enough to deal with the crisis and instead of going to war, seeking an agreement. Here I see a very important preventive role of international historical policy in order to prevent or tone historical conflicts, the partners must be willing to co cooperate and the organizer, the institution responsible for the project, must allow different points of view. This, extent, th this extends the entire process, but gives a chance for a lasting, broadly accepted effect. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for uh, all these insights and the timely, the timely comments. Um, with that, we will move on to the second speaker from ENRS, which is Gabor Dani. Um, he will present a paper entitled Soft Power and Competing Historical Narratives, Radio Free Europe and the Memory of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution. Um, Gabor has worked at ENRS since 2015. He has a PhD in Comparative Literature, specialist in Hungarian Literature and Philology, and his research focuses on cultural resistance in Hungary during the Cold War with a special emphasis on unofficial publications. The floor is yours, and the 20 minutes are running on the top of the screen. Running. Oh my God, okay, I try to be as quick as possible. Thank you very much for this well, opportunity. I'm really happy to be here. In my presentation, I will speak about the activities of Radio Free Europe uh, between the 1970s and uh, until the 19. 80s, and uh, this paper is the outcome, outcome of a research conducted in the Open Society Archives, Budapest. So, the 23rd of October 1956 was uh, one of the most Europe. I hope it didn't count. 
so once again, <laughs> so once again, the okay, sorry, interference. Okay, so once again, I start my presentation. Uh, it will be really exciting if if it goes like that. Um, the 20, 23rd of October in 1956 was one of the most euphoric days in Hungary's 20th century history. On that day, the Stalinist dictatorship was overthrown by a nationwide popular uprising and revolution. But the revolution could not win. The Soviets intervened with military force. Although the struggle for freedom and the street fighting lasted for weeks, the Soviets finally crushed the uprising and appointed a puppet government headed by Janos Kadar. The Kadar government restored communist rule in Hungary and remained in power for three decades. From that, that moment on, there were two opposing narratives of the events of October 1956. One saw the events as a counter-revolution, the other as a revolution. According to the official ideology of the communist Kadar regime, what happened in 1956 was a counter-revolution or organized by imperialist powers to restore the capitalist feudal system which existed between the two world wars. The narrative of counter-revolution was given full currency in Hungary, marked by the brutal repression after 1956, completely silencing the other narrative, the narrative of revolution. The counter-revolution was a constantly reaffirmed state propaganda narrative to which several newspaper articles, TV and radio programs were devoted, especially on the anniversaries. The narrative of the counter-revolution was retold, for example, in a six-part television series in 1986 entitled Our Living History, which gave voice to the elite of the Kada regime using highly selective historical sources adapted to the dem demands of the counter-revolutionary narrative. On the contrary, the narrative of revolution underlined that the general popular will in 1956 was to build a new, more just Hungary, free from Soviet control and restoring the country's sovereignty. This narrative was considered by broad masses of the people both at home and in the emigration, the true memory of 1956. However, this true memory could survive only thanks to actors and institutions operating in emigration. These Western institutions included the CIA-funded Radio Free Europe, which as a part of the American soft power played a crucial role in breaking down the isolation of Soviet bloc countries and broadcasting the memory of the 19th, 1956 revolution and uprising beyond the Iron Curtain to Hungary. In my presentation, I will examine uh, the memory of 19, 1956 Hungarian revolution in the light of the activities of Radio Free Europe by focusing primarily on the radio's commemoration programs between 1966 and 1986. My presentation will seek to answer to the question of why the broadcasts by Radio Free Europe uh, were successful in contrast to the official Hungarian media's interpretation of the past, at least in uh, 1986, what factors underpinned the narrative's credibility and authenticity. In the West, stations such as Radio Free Europe or BBC regularly commemorated the revolution in Hungarian language broadcasts transmi transmitted from behind the Iron Curtain. Commemoration programs played a prominent role on the 10th and the 30th anniversaries of the revolution in 1966 and 1986. In 1986, for example, uh, four years before communism collapsed in Central Europe, a wide repertoire of commemoration programs were broadcast concerning the background, the events, as well as the aftermath of the 1956 revolution, mainly edited by one of the radio speakers, Laszlo Kassa, a Hungarian emigre. Naturally, the Radio Free Europe's commemoration programs run parallel to those aired in the socialist mass media, thus listeners had no choice but to question the authenticity of these contradictory sources. Unfortunately, time constraints prevent me from exploring the narrative of the socialist mass media. I will focus only on uh, Radio Free Europe. 
So how do we know what impact these radio broadcasts had on listeners beyond the Iron Curtain? I used uh, two sets of sources, uh, the so-called information items for the reconstruction of the 10th anniversary and transcriptions of the radio's answering machine for the 30th anniversary. The so-called information items were gathered at Radio Free Europe's Munich headquarters as a means of reducing the state of isolation the radio was in regarding information coming from the Eastern Bloc. These documents were generally based on correspondence conducted with anonymous sources located within the Bloc or interviews provided by Eastern emigrants. Their reliability and credibility was carefully checked by various filtering system. Concerning the, uh, the feedback provided by listeners on the uh, commemoration programs, another source of evidence is also available. The transcripts of telephone calls recorded by the radio's answering machine uh, in the second half of the 1980s. Set up in 1985, the answering machine was intended to modernize the communication channel between Radio Free Europe and its audience while also replacing correspondence. The answering machine recorded listeners' calls and messages in two-minute uh, intervals around the clock, 24 hours a day. The transcripts, and this is very important, preserved the listeners' views without any kind of distortion. So let me just cite from the sources. Uh, from 1956 about the impact of um, the radio had on Hungarian society. I quote, Radio Free Europe is considered the great enemy of the regime, which has a great deal of influence on both the young and the adult population of the country. Another uh, feedback uh, already on the commemoration programs, even as we keep trying to forget the October events, we were pleased to listen to a proper commemoration of this national event. There were also listeners who listened both the communication programs of BBC and Radio Free Europe, and one of them said, I quote, the commemoration of Radio Free Europe was the more objective and, the beautiful, of, and beautiful of the two. And there are also uh, quotations from the uh, transcripts, transcriptions of the answering machine from 1986. I quote, great work boys, great work girls. I cannot say anything else. I haven't heard for 30 years such a beautiful and touching commemoration. And another one, first of all, I would like to say thank you for the carefully, co carefully compiled documentary program, which was broadcast these days on the occasion of the freedom fight. I myself, who I am over 60 years old, took part in the 1956 events and can testify that the documentary is trustworthy down to its smallest detail. So what were the main characteristics of these commemoration programs from the perspective of the listeners? As a very characteristic feature of the feedback, listeners emphasized the role of the original audio documents. Uh, again, I quote, I spoke of this program to several acquaintances and it was the general opinion that such programs are very necessary with the help of original sound recordings to refute the official lies that distort the past. Similar opinions may be uh, quoted from 1986 as well. It must be emphasized that Radio Free Europe possesses the most complete archival collection of broadcasts made in Hungary at the time of the revolution. In order to acquire information, Radio Free Europe closely followed the events in the so-called target countries by listening to and recording the official radio broadcasts coming through air, to coming through the air from the communist world, as István Rev put it. During the days of the revolution, the Hungarian desk's entire attention was directed toward the events unfolding in Hungary. At the time, Radio Free Kossuth as well as an increasing number of amateur independent radio stations served as the main source of information. Throughout each day of the revolution, their broadcasts were being recorded on magnetic tape uh, by the Radio Free Europe's uh, archival machinery. As a result, a unique collection of historical archives was created that served as a source of, source of original audio documents 
to be broadcast again and again into Hungary during uh, Kader's regime. And now at this moment, I would like to show you one of these uh, one of these audio documents. If it works. It was extremely hard to understand, right? Uh, not only because it was Hungarian, but also because of the very bad quality. So that was exactly the point I wanted to show you, uh, how bad the quality was uh, of, this, uh, of this audio recordings. Um, but I, would, I will return to this question, but now I would like to start from another point of view. So the role of original sound recordings uh, should be discussed in terms of two groups, groups of listeners. For the older generation, the original scene of listening from 1956 repeated in 1986. Thus, um, the programs stimulated the work of personal memory, recalling forgotten experiences. I quote again, the original recordings of Minsanti Imran at Kadar, the prominent figures of the revolution, revived the already dim recollection of the people at home. The other characteristic pattern of uh, reception was related of jamming. In the 1950s, radio listeners became familiar with the jamming of Western radio broadcasts. Jamming signaled the permanent presence of Soviet power. In 1986, listeners, as a consequence of their social conditioning, also attributed to the reception's bad quality, not to atmospheric noise, but to the jamming that had actually been stopped in 1972 in Hungary. Thus, the bad quality of the commemoration programs once again signaled the presence of the repressive communist authorities that had crushed the revolution and suppressed its history. The jamming also had a paradoxical legit legitimizing effect. The jamming as a suppression of the truth gave credibility to the Radio Free Europe's broadcasts. Original sound recordings had a different significance for the younger generation who had no direct experience of uh, 1956. Many listeners recognized the idiosyncratic voice, idiosyncratic nature uh, of the voices and the sound played back, which they could clear, clearly identify. So this link between the sound coming from the radio and the body of the former speaker in the listener's mind authenticated the audio documents. This was important because many audio documents were played back in Radio Free Europe that had become inaccessible in Hungary due to the purges of memory under the Kadar regime. For example, Janos Kadar, before his betrayal, when he himself was on, on, on the side of the revolution, called the recent events the glorious uprising of our people. And this speech was replayed in original version several times by the radio. As a listener said, I quote, uh, the audio documents were a real experience for me, like then radio speeches of Imranaj or radio speech of Janos Kadar with the promises he has not kept. If I had not heard it from his own mouth, I would have not believed it, really. So original documents carried out a kind of acoustic verification for the whole commemoration program. The replay of the original audio documents demonstrates that the primary inscription proved to be timeless and was able to emerge authentically as a kind of palimpsest breaking through the layers of the official counter-revolutionary narrative. And in general, it can be said that the Radio Free Europe's commemoration programs have brought the 1956 revolution back to the present. In this process, the comm commemoration programs relied not only on meaning effects, but also on presence effects, as Hans Uri Gumbrecht uh, distinguished them. It means that according to the German theorist, the original sound recordings functioned as presence effects 
the Radio Free Europe's programs mobilized uh, the materialities of communication, the communication ch channel, alongside the semantic dimension in the transmission. In other words, presence effects work to strengthen meaning effects in the sense that perception of the physical characteristics of the original documents surrounded the reception's semantic dimension. When replayed 30 years later, the audio inserts originally recorded in 1956 resulted in the resurrection of both the martyrs of the revolution and the apparently dead revolution. In the case of Radio Free Europe, the Gumbrechtian presence effects played an important role in creating a brand of authenticity rooted in archival practices and information acquisition, the media technological conditions of recording and replaying human voices, as well as the listener's social conditioning and personal recollections. Radio Free Europe's Europe as a soft power tool thus documented, stored for decades and shared with Hungarian people their own experiences. When reading the transcriptions of telephone calls made to the Radio Free Europe's answering machine, a memory community takes shape, which was created by the radio within the space of radio listening. The programs of Radio Free Europe generated a significant listener response in Hungary. Based on the commemoration programs, even a book was published by the uh, Radio Free Europe in 1987, which was reproduced and was circulated also in a samizdat form beyond the Iron Curtain. Listeners recorded the broadcasts and some of them even made transcriptions of the broadcast for their own private archives. So this case study showed uh, the role of the foreign radio station in keeping suppressed memory alive and also how it contributed to the development or the maintenance of a memory community. Documentation, authenticity, the creation of coherent historical narratives supported by primary historical sources and the question of how, this, how to support this process to a large extent are of particular importance at a time when history is repeating itself and the neighboring country, Ukraine, is experiencing a similar or even more brutal great power aggression than that of Hungary in 1956. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Gabor. And <clears throat> now we move on to our fourth paper, um, Gruya Badescu from the University of Constance, uh, where he is currently working at the Institute for Advanced Study and is part of the research group Reconstructing Memory in the City, Transnational and Local European Sites of Memory. And before that, um, Gruya got his PhD from the Department of Architecture at the University of Cambridge and then went to work at the other university in Britain, um, as well as the New Europe College. And now we're looking forward to your presentation entitled Reshaping Space, Reshaping Memory, International Actors and the Post-War Reconstruction of Cities. Well, thank you very much. And I suspect I'm the reason why we're having a medal, because in both in Poland and in Germany, people think that, I, that my name, Gruya, will be a female name. So I would suspect that's, uh, that can be a culprit for, for, for my presence. Uh, uh, on this panel, but no, I'm just, uh, what I wanted to say first of all, thank you for, for having, me having me here. Not only that the conference is absolutely um, fascinating, but also it's always, go, uh, always great to come back to War Warsaw, the place that actually started my interest in poster reconstruction. As when I was um, very young, um, be before turning 20 and before actually going to Middlebury College, I, I actually am I'm, I'm excited to see that this finally somewhere on this side of the pond also, with a link to Middlebury. I got a scholarship to, to study there, but before that, the summer before, I, I traveled to Warsaw. And I saw something that for most people here, it's their everyday built environment, but for me, coming from Romania, was something very interesting. The idea of a rebuilt city, a city that not only that it, it got rebuilt, and I don't know how this works, okay. Yes, so most of people in the room know that this happened after, um, in, in the late 40s, the decision to actually rebuild using uh, Goleto's paintings to actually recover the Stare Miasto of Warsaw 
really struck me as something connected with, with a particular way of, of, of dealing with the past. The polls did not allow the, um, that Hitler's decision to annihilate the capital will, um, will, will have an impact on, uh, on, on, on the city. So they rebuilt brick by brick. But my question then was what happened in, what happened with the bottom? No, that was, that was not the question. What happened with the, with the neighboring country, the one that inflicted the destruction of, of Poland's capital. So what happened with these multitude of cities that were destroyed by the, by the Anglo-Americans? And what happened in, uh, in the double situation that Germany had to face? Reconstruction, but also coming to terms with, with what was happening uh, in terms of starting the war and, and the, the, um, the various discussions of guilt that will come actually to haunt for future generations. In the, gen in the reconstruction generation, of course, that, that didn't happen to the same extent. But this actually started the, the, a project that, that I've been um, uh, investigating in different, in different places and in diff at different times. So what is actually the connection between reconstruction of cities and dealing with the past? So m memory, and somehow also in this uh, duty to remember uh, uh, clothes, um, given by political philosophy, how does that connect with the questions that architects and planners and many other actors ask when they have to rebuild cities? So when we talk about reconstruction, m many of us think first of uh, housing and infrastructure or architectural form, but what about the thinking about dealing with the, uh, with the past, with the difficult memory in the act of rebuilding cities? So this is something that um, is going to be, I mean, it's, also, it's also the theme of my forthcoming book, which is about reconstruction and, um, and dealing with the past after the Second World War in a number of, 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 of places. And so what I, will talk to, I will, I will thought, what I thought of doing today, and sorry, the lunch is working in, in my brain, uh, the postprandial soporific effect. So um, what I thought of doing today is actually l looking at the amount of, of actors that in a number of situations had an impact on reshaping cities, it, I, I found it very striking in a number of arch ar archival, but also um, interviewing uh, situations to, talk, to, to, to deal with the international. So if we are to look at the actors that are usually involved in, uh, in rebuilding cities um, after war, we, one can see a lot of domestic actors at different scales. So of course, from the, from the city to the, to the state regions, but we also see um, that they are quite quite a few um, international actors involved. So, so how do we make sense of this? So on the one hand, if you, if you are to talk about international relations, and, and we heard this morning uh, a conversation about IR and memory, we see that cities as, um, as places where things, um, uh, where things happen uh, at a particular scale also have a new, um, a new attention focus in, in international studies. So we can see the cities have challenged IR, but most of the discussion is about global, uh, global cities, well-connected global cities, how they, they change the, the, the state paradigm, or fragility, state, uh, cities as, as fragile places where conflict is somehow connected with, the, um, um, with, sta with state security as, as a challenge. And there's a, a bit uh, incipient attention on, on urban peace building, so, so, so cities as places where peace can be made. But what I found striking is that memory doesn't, doesn't play a lot of role into, into, in this discussion. So if we are to bridge to the way more vibrant field of urban memory, since Alvax, we've been talking that cities are somehow arenas of memory practices, but also urban space can be a mediator of memory. And to just give one, uh, uh, one example, if we are to look at rebuilding Beirut after the, the civil war, we see that the reshaping of the built environment invokes the tropes of la belle époque, of the Paris of the Middle East, and the aspiration to recover that, while on the other hand is a project for the future with echoes of Dubai uh, uh, next door. So somehow reconstruction is always in between this recovery of the past and using narratives uh, connected to the past and uh, projects for the future. So now, if we are to, um, to bring this together, so. In, within this uh, literature on cities and memory and, and the budding interest in cities and IR, my interest in urban re post-reconstruction and memory also is a good place to start to actually look at the role of, of, this, international, uh, of this international actor. So I'll take you to a few places. I'll focus on Sarajevo just for the sake of, of today's uh, um, limited time, but the, the paper discusses the other situations more at length. So, uh, and what I, what I wanted to argue is that the post-reconstruction of cities is a process of specialization of memory battles between groups. 
so tracing the, the involvement of international actors, and looking at the urban and spatial dimension of memory diplomacy. So um, this keeps, um, am I doing something wrong? How do I, okay, I think we jumped to um, one. So what I, I'm looking at, on the one hand, the intentionality aspect. So motivations and agendas of this international actor. So why do we have international actors take, taking part in, um, in, uh, in reconstruction? And, but also at the consequence. So what is the impact of, of this urban and architectural interventions connected to international actors in domestic memory politics? So taking you to, to Sarajevo, the city that was uh, depicted um, already before the war as a Jerusalem of Europe, in this case, um, implying this idea of coexistence between, um, uh, between different uh, groups uh, with different religious backgrounds. One can see in the built environment this combination of Catholic churches, Orthodox churches, synagogues, mosques, all together. So this was definitely affected by, uh, um, this is, can I get more minutes? Because, sorry. Um, yeah, so, um, so basically we, we associate Sarajevo also with, with what happened in the 1990s with the longest siege of a capital city do, um, in, in modern history, so um, in which the city was, uh, was under attack for about three years by the paramilitary Bosnian Serbs um, groups. And that all had an impact on, the, um, on people, on killing many people, but also on the ar architectural, uh, the built environment. So one uh, famous example is the city hall, the, the national library, the Vietnica, which was described by um, you know, Bogdan Bogdanovic as an example of herbicide, the destruction of cities, of the idea of coexistence of cultural uh, institutions. Herbicide is a very potent uh, concept, which now is, is invoked also in connection with, with Ukraine, uh, but it was generated by this discussion in Sarajevo of this institution. So while these three years of, uh, of siege um, saw, uh, let's say, um, a, a passive presence of the international community, in the reconstruction process, suddenly international actors come in. And they come in with a vengeance. So, for instance, in the case of, of, the, of the city hall, the reconstruction was, um, um, was done with funds coming from state governments, from uh, particularly Spain and Austria, the European Union, and a number of other, other actors. And, um, and somehow this attention to sites of coexistence can also lead us to think of, of the, inten in the intention to, uh, to do, this, um, to, uh, to do this, uh, this reconstruction. Interventions of regret, somehow regretting, as Zaku Dizarevich, a journalist, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, the main daily in, uh, in Bosnia during the war, says the international community came here to eliminate the bad memory of not taking a more active stance. So, so now reconstruction somehow was perceived as a way of, um, of coming and, and, uh, and showing an international presence. And as uh, an EU special representative in Bosnia said, cultural heritage, the protection and promotion and reconstruction is very important somehow as a catalyst for this inter-ethnic and intercultural understanding in the future. So this idea of coexistence and common heritage, it's, uh, it's one of the things that the EU in particular stresses. And this of course, has something to do with the, with the cosmopolitan memory and heritage that the, um, the EU memory regime uh, is, is already narrating. So somehow the way that it deals with reconstruction, the sites that it selects are connected with this, somehow a pan-European uh, form of memory and heritage. On the other hand, Oh, sorry, and then we can see that also in state, um, state uh, actors like for instance, Italy will, will build a, a monument to multiculturalism in the center of Sarajevo. Is there another way to, <laughs> to click on this? Because, oh, thank you very much, sorry. Maybe it's the battery, I'll try. Yeah, yeah, great. So on the, one, uh, on the, uh, on the other hand, we have to look into, um, a disintentionality also connected with, with longer histories. So for instance, the reconstruction of the, of the city hall of the, um, of, of the Vizhnitsa was is connected with, with Austria. And Austria is actually the, um, the country that during the, uh, the administration of Bosnia by the Habsburg Empire also had a quite, um, quite an interest in promoting Sarajevo as a window of the Habsburg monarchy to the, to, to the Balkans. So in the 
in its, in its participation in the reconstruction and, uh, and the main role that it had at the opening of, the, of this building in 2014, actually on Europe's day, uh, uh, what was interesting is how inside you had all these uh, uh, diplomats um, and speeches coming from the Austrian side, and outside, a big screen in which people, myself infiltrated in, the, in that crowd, were listening to, to untranslated speeches in German and people commenting that somehow it's, um, the empire is back. So they, they're speaking German to us w without having any, any uh, Bosnian or local language subtitles. So somehow, what does it mean when we, we, when we see uh, a longer um, durée of, of, of these particular actors that are involved? And of course, Austria is one of them, but the longer pe uh, period in, the, in um, uh, sorry, the, the longer rule in, uh, in Bosnia was uh, by the Ottoman Empire, and in this case, uh, Erdogan's neo-Ottoman uh, politics is also manifested through, through reconstruction, through reconstruction of uh, religious buildings such as the uh, this teke, uh, outside of uh, just outside of uh, central Sarajevo, or through various forms of um, um, of, of, of business and um, and and the, in the Turkish development agency's role in, in rebuilding in the last in the last decades. Erdogan has famously uh, thanked. Um, after one of his victories in elections, he said this is a victory that's not only for Ankara and Istanbul, it's also for Sarajevo and for Beirut. So this is also an example how getting involved in, in various uh, um, urban projects is also um, a showcase of this, of this new Ottoman policy. And uh, if we are to go into other actors that actually are not connected somehow historically to um, to, to the space, we also see a, a lot of interest from, from the, from the uh, Islamic world in, in, uh, in repaying, in, let's say, in, in, um, enter, in going into this, this region feeling that Islam in Europe has been abandoned. So this is narratives of, of a number of state officials from Saudi Arabia, also from, um, from Malaysia and Indonesia, who will, who will then uh, erect mosques uh, paid by, the, by the, uh, those states' governments kind of to to help the, the Muslims who suffered there uh, while uh, the West did nothing in, 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 the, in some of the, you can find this in some of the declarations. And so this way they contribute to changing the, um, also the, the landscape by bringing in particularly in socialist neighborhoods this kind of uh, architecture. Also, this is contested in the renovation, restoration of mosques, which the Saudis are whitewashing in a very different way that the Balkan mosques will, will, will look like, very colorful. In this case, it's whitewashed. The, the Salafi practices of purity are imposed, which the locals, uh, the local conservationists, for instance, uh, they, they oppose. And also the presence of the Saudis is not only in restoring, but also in, in, in building new mosques and new, and new centers, uh, new religious um, um, awareness centers, while neighborhoods around remain uh, unrebuilt. So one can see that the interest is in these particular forms of, of, of uh, cultural uh, diplomacy as opposed to, to this, the so, the more social needs, and including also shopping malls and, uh, um, and places where practices are actually are more akin to the to the Saudi. For instance, there's a ban on alcohol in a country that quite that consumes on various religions consume uh, consume alcohol here. So what we see that actually these uh, these international um, presence somehow is is what is doing on the on the urban um, built environment, but also practices is actually enforcing some of uh, what we see here is this yellow line, the division that actually exists in in Bosnia Herzegovina, the entity inter uh, border line between the Republika Srpska and the Federation of Bosnia Herzegovina, which crosses in the city. Because what you can see on the other side, and I don't have now time for, for that, also, for instance, Serb uh, Ser a Serbian uh, presence, for instance, a, a school that was inaugurated by the president of Serbia. So different actors participate here, but what is interesting is from the local uh, perspective, memorialization becomes also a sign of, of, the, of the, uh, defiance. So in this case, this is the monument of the international community, and it's a, sp uh, a can of spam. Why? Because in, the, in one of the, the common narratives is that w the only thing that the internationals did was just um, um, send from the skies cans of uh, expired spam meat. So this is somehow showing also the, the, um, a sense of ironic bi bitterness. I want to, uh, by looking at all these state actors and state agencies, I want to actually change a bit the scale. Because uh, I, I, what I found um, in the archives of the 90s, uh, we, we can see that other actors to take part. Cities, cities contribute in reshaping cities. So on the one hand, you have cities like Bursa, which is uh, helping the 
uh, reconstruction and sorry, the restoration of, of mosques. But that's part of the Turkish, Bursa is a Turkish city, part of the Turkish policy. But then I was more interested in, in, in this example. Barcelona plays a very Im I, uh, important role both in, in uh, supporting the city during the 1990s uh, siege, in the reconstruction, he has different uh, uh, partnerships. There's a lot of money coming from Barcelona, which makes it um, a quite um, unique um, actor. And the question is, what's the intentionality? What, why, why Barcelona in particular? So uh, the main narrative was um, in Catalonia, 1992, when Barcelona was um, an Olympic city, that Sarajevo was also an Olympic city in 84, and that's a way to actually connect to Olympic cities. However, uh, one can also see the traces that in the moment when Bosnia and Herzegovina declares independence, parts of the, of the Catalan political and, um, memory and memory landscape are also activated in, in thinking um, also about what's happening in Spain at the same time, and particularly the memory that of the civil war comes back, in, and somehow this these different elements make Barcelona be uniquely interested in, in, in Sarajevo in ways that other cities did not. So one can even go beyond the, the state and look at, at how, on the one hand, the, the city hall, uh, then the Generalitat de Catalunya take part and, and bypass the usual scales that, that, that we are uh, experiencing. And then, um, now, I will say goodbye to um, Sarajevo for, um, uh, and go just a bit into some, some other examples just to, sh to show other forms of, uh, of uh, entanglements. And, um, and one of the cities I, I discuss more at length in the, in the paper is, this, is the case of Beirut, when the, the, civil, the Lebanese Civil War, but also the, um, I look at this, how, the, how the south of, of Beirut is being rebuilt, so the Dahie neighborhood is rebuilt after 2006 with a lot of atten uh, money and attention from Iran. And Iran declares that the, the main point of reconstruction is to strengthen this area, the area is known for being the headquarters of Hezbollah, and this way to actually, uh, it supports uh, the anti-Israeli um, pol uh, politics of, of uh, led, led from Hezbollah. So somehow this reconstruction is not only about recovery of, of housing of the Shia, um, who are core religionists with Iran, but also has a geopolitical implication. And sometimes these geopolitical implications are not even connected with conflict. So I'll take you to a city that's, uh, that's, uh, that had an experience of conflict, but in which the, um, the most um, striking things in the geopolitical configurations come after. So this is the city of Belgrade, and uh, um, in Belgrade, in the last um, uh, 10 years, there was a lot of discussion of this, this largest uh, project of, um, of urban remaking in southeastern Europe. This is done by Emirates, Emirates company. Um, and so one could, one could argue, and this is the state uh, a month ago, it's, it's all, all, already realized after a lot of contestation in, in, in the Serbian capital. But one, one interesting thing is that this urban project, urban remaking, can be read as uh, the typical uh, neoliberal urbanism um, state of the um, Yes, of the of the um, of the of the, gov of the um, what was I saying? I saw uh, I saw that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so it can be a typical neoliberal urban um, urbanist project, but in this case, actually, the the agreement between between the Vucic, the the leader of Serbia, and the Emirates comes with an arms deal, actually harbored by a by a Palestinian, uh, Mohammed Dahlem, who was very important in Palestine. So somehow we see geopolitical alignments, which I can talk in the Q&A, um, in between, uh, in between um, the Middle East and, and the Balkans in ways that are, that, are quite, um, that, that are quite surprising. And I will, for interest of time, there's still ruins in Belgrade, and the ruins have, can be used also for geopolitical. So the one thing that, that I, uh, I just had an article coming out in geopolitics about Serbia and Russia and how urban space is used, is used for, um, for as a form of display in which and memory battles are somehow also represented in the urban uh, environment. But somehow, maybe to uh, th this image of, uh, of Slavia Square in, um, in, um, in Belgrade shows us that while Zajedno, the, being together between Serbia and uh, and and, uh, and Russia is um, appears as a as a main main point. Bigger, it's the is the commercial to Lidl. So somehow the economics somehow tr trump um, other other interests. And now, finally, this is the conclusion. Uh, 
the, which, so we, we saw that it, a number of international actors, they reshape cities. I hope that the bottom would have worked better. Uh, international actors function at different scales. So we saw states, we saw cities, and uh, different forms of identities are being strengthened, but also forms of remembering and amnesia. And maybe, yeah. <coughs> Reconstruction also means f continuing violence through other means. So I look forward to your questions. Yeah, apologies for chasing you, but we've got one more paper and a discussant, and we've got 60 minutes left, and I'm sure there are people who want to ask questions, so we need to keep moving. Just one organizational question. Um, Zhen Wang, who is supposed to be the discussant, um, I can't find him on the Zoom that I have got here, but is he, is he there? Maybe you could, well, just to make sure that we have the discussant, um, that would be great. Um, and before that, we've got Tomasz, um, who comes to us from the Jagiellonian University, and he's going to present a paper entitled Auschwitz as a Subject of Polish and Israeli Politics of Memory. Tomasz got his PhD um, from the Department of Political Relations at Jagiellonian University in 2014 with a dissertation on the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum in the years 1980 to 2010. Tomasz is also a practitioner. He's a licensed tour leader in Poland and Central Europe um, and has funded a research kind of an historical interpretation center entitled Poland Travel and most recently the Teen Flying University, which has at its aim to promote education of Polish youth. So I think that's all very promising for um, an interesting paper and I look forward to your, to your remarks um, over the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, for, for this introduction. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it was always very inspiring to see the title Genealogies of Memory, because this is exactly what I was focusing for the last 20 years of my work. Uh, I'm a practicing genealogist myself. Um, so I do a lot of genealogical research in Central Europe. But a part of that, I'm also a scholar of political science, uh, particularly uh, trauma-related memory and memory of the Holocaust. So I'm coming to you with a paper about Auschwitz, uh, which is, uh, however badly it sounds, my natural habitat. Uh, that's a place in which I lived for the first 18 years of my life. And when I was growing up in the city, there was a certain number of conflicts resonating in the 80s and 90s, conflicts in between the Polish and Jewish or Polish and Israeli communities of memory, which uh, transformed Auschwitz into a certain kind of a battlefield. Uh, and for the, at least 20 years of the 80s and 90s, Auschwitz was a certain battlefield. Interestingly enough, the resolution of those conflicts uh, that appeared throughout the 80s and 90s are very much shaping and defining our global understanding of the Holocaust today. We have very little understanding of that, but uh, this is pretty much the time when uh, our general global understanding of the Holocaust was being coined in the form of Polish, Israeli, Polish, Jewish memorial conflicts of the 80s and 90s. But I wouldn't like to talk about the 80s and 90s. Uh, I would like to bring you to very practical cases which uh, were resonating in the Polish, Jewish, or Polish, Israel relations in the 2000s. Uh, a little bit less known but very interesting because they started to resonate at the time when we all fought, I mean we all, meaning the Poles and the Jews and the Israelis, we all thought that the bad times are over. We all thought that we created enough of linkages, enough of institutions and enough of common ground in order to resolve any possible conflict that may come, yet at the same time new conflicts arrived. And uh, this being said, uh, I shall also mention that uh, the place called Auschwitz apparently still has an enormous conflict potential. It's just a matter of time when and who will use it and abuse it. Uh, so uh, starting my little presentation, I'll try to kind of bypass the very theoretical part of my paper, but uh, I cannot help myself uh, not to resonate the words of Professor Reynolds, uh, mostly uh, about a certain ontological security and uh, ontological grounds that shall be established. And uh, this being said, uh, I need to define very basically how do I understand the three basic terms that I'm using in my paper? Those definitions are naive, 
but I think they are very important, especially in the nowadays postmodern reality in which the words like politics, history, and memory are being generally used and abused in the world of journalism, in the world of politics, and in the world of social media. Uh, so how do you understand politics? Very simple. The politics is an art of governing a state, coordinated activities aiming at realization of common good. Simple. Naive. Uh, how do we understand history? History, at first, is a social science. History is a social science, uh, which studies the past human activities and creations, and as a social science, it has its methodology. It's chronological, it has uh, fact-effect relation, uh, it's building coherent narratives, and most importantly, it's based on the value of truth and memory. Uh, memory is an individual or social set of imaginations about history. It's a certain set of myths, values, and patterns of conduct. Uh, memory does not have a scientific character. We are trying to give it and understand it for science, but as such, it does not have a scientific character. It's polyphonic and subjective. So, uh, as I said, I would need to bypass most of my theoretical considerations, uh, yet at the same time I cannot uh, stop myself from a little comment about another chaos and mishmash, particularly in the world of politics and the usage of the term politics of history versus the politics of memory. Uh, what am I talking about? The term politics of history, particularly used in the Central European context, particularly used in the Polish context, if you frame it in the categories that I've just uh, defined of what history and what memory is, uh, does not have any space of existence. I mean, you shall never talk about conducting the politics of memory, a uh, politics of history. Uh, the phrase of politics of history represents a completely dichotomous juxtaposition of two incongruent realities. I mean, you can talk about the politics of history maybe in the realities of uh, authoritarian regimes, uh, as it used to be an old USSR joke, in which uh, once the USSR finally grasped most of the domains of politics and economy, the hardest thing to decide and plan has always been history itself. So maybe in such a setting of an authoritarian state you can talk about the politics of memory. Otherwise, we shall always talk about the politics of history. Otherwise, we shall always talk about the politics of memory itself. Uh, applying logic, if a political agent or any kind of an institution is talking about uh, using or creating the politics of, of politics of history, it's actually becoming very counterproductive to what you want to reach. Because you are informing the audience that uh, you are about to create a historical reality which will be politically useful. So by using the term the politics of history as a political agent, you are doing something which is exactly counterproductive to what you want to reach. Uh, of course, assuming logic and rationality represents any kind of commonly shared values. Uh, so the level of engagement into the politics of memory is uh, correlated uh, very much with the dominant political system that the country embraces. And here I'm going through different forms of uh, liberal democracies into more authoritarian systems and how they are changing. I'm also talking about tools which are applied in uh, conducting the politics of uh, memory by the state agents. But let me kind of jump into the very nature of the Polish and Israeli relations and Auschwitz as a certain battlefield in the middle. Uh, definitely uh, Auschwitz as a place uh, is defined by the Polish and Jewish and Polish and Israeli uh, communities of memory as uh, one of the most fragile of the shared historical sites. Uh, and for this very reason, it's becoming the core of producing 
the politics of memory by the state agents and politicians on different levels. And as I said, uh, I was mostly researching the conflicts which very much uh, created the uh, contemporary understanding of the Holocaust, of so the conflicts of the 80s and 90s. But let me bring you two examples, two case studies of conflicts of the 2000s. One of them is the so-called Memorial Flight. Memorial Flight was an event that happened over Auschwitz, over Birkenau, in the year of 2003. Uh, what was it all about? Uh, on September 4th, 2003, uh, three Israeli jets, F-15s exactly, flew over Birkenau in a kind of a commemorative flight of a decide itself. Uh, interestingly enough, this very flight, in spite of the fact that there were already bodies and organizations existing to consult such happenings, this flight was never debated uh, before it happened within the framework of Polish and Israeli or Polish and Jewish institutions. Uh, the Polish authorities were completely taken by surprise by the fact that it's been organized at all. Uh, the Israeli air forces used the fact that the Polish government organized the 85th anniversary of the establishment of the Polish, uh, of the Polish air forces. And in the flight itinerary of the three um, Israeli jets, uh, it was kind of interjected that they are going to fly over a very high altitude of a Birkenau, and that was it. The museum was never consulted on that. Uh, a little bit over a week before the flight actually happened, in late August of 2003, there was a little snippet uh, published in Jerusalem Post. Actually, it was more than a little snippet because it was in the front page. And in the text published, you could read proudly displaying the Blue Star of David, three fighters, the deadliest planes in the Israeli Air Force arsenal, will go down low and fly straight over the platform where the Nazis carried out selections which resulted in the deaths in the gas chambers for hundreds of thousands of Jews. So this is how the event was journalistically framed and this is actually how this event was released to the world. Uh, there was little time for reaction because it was uh, a little bit under a week to the event itself. Uh, the Polish State Museum uh, and uh, the International Auschwitz Council reacted kind of immediately, uh, expressing its disapproval for such a demonstration of military, military power over the memorial site. But pretty much it was too late. Uh, Finally, the event, uh, after a couple of days of being debated, took a slightly, or was supposed to take a little bit uh, different, uh, uh, a little bit different uh, organizational pattern. Uh, there was supposed to be three Polish MiG-29 planes assisting the Israeli planes. Those were cancelled. And uh, the Israeli planes were only allowed to fly at a very high altitude. Well, uh, officially, due to the bad weather and low visibility, uh, the Polish planes were cancelled. But despite of the bad weather, the planes flew low, still barely visible over Birkenau, where there was a ceremony for about 100 Israeli soldiers that were commemorating the camp victims. And such an event is becoming a secondary memorial event in the history of Auschwitz itself. Uh, so we are talking about another layer of memory being aided and just positioned over the original body of what Auschwitz represents. Uh, and how does it resonate? It resonates greatly. Uh, in uh, only nine years later, in 2012, uh, one of the pilots that was commanding the first plane in the chain of the free Israeli fighters was about to be appointed was about to be appointed as the commander-in-chief of the AIF, so of the Israeli Air Forces. And the text appears in Jerusalem Post again, uh, suggesting that it's only Eshel, his name was Amir Eshel, it's only Eshel who, without hesitation, would undertake the bombing of Iranian's nuclear installations because he was the one who, in 2003, commanded the historic mission to fly over Auschwitz and he, supposed to respond to the limitations of the Polish air control with the following statement, 
We have been listening to polls for 800 years. Today, we don't have to listen to them anymore. So the so-called memorial flight presented as a form of commemoration of the victims of the former camp has become a secondary political event in the camp history itself. The photoshopped images of the, of the plains of Birkenau uh, up until now presented in various public buildings in Jerusalem or generally all over Israel. Uh, the Israeli media recorded the 10th anniversary of this flight with relevant articles uh, and in such way they were very instrumentally contributing to the construction of an Israeli identity on the basis of the secondary events in Auschwitz history. Uh, the IDF itself recognized the flight itself, but also the military visits to the site as a core element of the military interest, as uh, starting and uh, spiking the military interest among young Israelis. And uh, I'm the very last person to criticize the defense politics of Israel because I lived in the country and I fully understand with uh, what kind of a lack of understanding the West is observing certain moves that Israel has to take for its own defense. But yet at the same time, I would question whether a display of such a military might, to quote the words of a newspaper, the deadliest in the arsenal, is the right form of commemoration of a place of genocide. And that's a question which shall be asked as a result of an event like this, especially that, as I said, it created a, second, a secondary memory which became a point of reference for many up until now. This entire story is getting convoluted also with a big, bigger question, so this big question in the Holocaust uh, historiography of why Auschwitz was not bombed. I'm a practitioner and I work a lot with uh, teens, both Israeli and Polish teens, and it's not uncommon to have questions asked those days that, uh, in which the students are telling us that, uh, no, it is not true, the Israeli fighters were flying over Auschwitz. But they are completely mismatching the time reality and the context of those flights, which is disturbing, to say the least, and damaging for history as such. Interestingly enough, this also resonates with the Ukrainian conflict today. How? Uh, this event, the flight itself, uh, became defining for the Jewish diaspora. How? Uh, as a result of the revolution and the overthrow of President Yanukovych in Ukraine in February uh, 2014, uh, the local Jewish community became target of uh, anti-Semitic attacks in the destabilized country. Uh, there were a couple of anti-Semitic attacks, uh, attacks in late February of uh, 2014. Uh, the Gimat Rosa synagogue in Zaporozhye was actually pelted with Molotov cocktails. Uh, something, by the way, we see for the last few months uh, happening in the general conflict zone of uh, Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. Uh, so anti-Semitism as a way of uh, sparking attention uh, by all kinds of services uh, that are active in the region. Um, but as a result of this attack on the, on the Gimad Rosa synagogue, Rabbi Menahem Margolin, the chairperson of the European Jewish Association, issued a letter, and the letter was addressed to the Prime Minister of, Def uh, the Prime Minister of Israel, the Minister of Defense, uh, in, uh, and in this letter he writes, the recent flight of Auschwitz uh, the recent flight of the Israeli Air Force over Auschwitz was a clear message that Israel will ensure the safety of Jews around the world, even outside their borders. I urge you to take all steps, including the deployment of security agents, to ensure the safety of Jewish communities in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, the event itself has its repercussions. Interestingly enough, in the last seven months, there were about 40 thousands of Jews evacuated from the conflict zone of Ukraine, Belarus, Belarus, and uh, uh, and Russia, mm, of which majority were actually the Russian Jews themselves. Another event about which you will 
well, I have to read in my paper, uh, is the case from 2006, 2007. Uh, it's a fascinating diplomatic, it's a fascinating diplomatic case about the name change of Auschwitz in the official UNESCO documents. Uh, so uh, in 2006, 2007, there was a, uh, a diplomatic offensive st stroke by the Polish Ministry of Culture, uh, again, without negotiating with the Israeli partners, which resulted in the official name change of Auschwitz in the uh, UNESCO documents. This is uh, interesting to read about, mostly because my sources for this uh, reconstruction of what happened are showing the very kitchen of diplomacy, because I found an enormous resource in the WikiLeaks of the diplomatic cables from that time period, which are showing you the exact reactions of different Israeli, American, uh, and Polish supposed diplomatic partners. Uh, so uh, I have one and a half a minute, so I'll just jump into my conclusions. Uh, uh, the Example that I've created, uh, the example that I've uh, talked about, and also the other one about the name change, is showing us again the importance of dialogue, the importance of having any kind of relations uh, and any kind of dialogue going, even if it's a very basic form of dialogue in which you are just listing the discrepancies that are happening in between the countries, it still has a value. Uh, at the time when the discussion is over, at the time when the institutions are suspended, just like uh, we just recuperate, we're just recuperating from a rather gruesome time period of the International Auschwitz Council being suspended from 2018 to July of 2022, uh, uh, when the institutions are suspended, the relations are becoming dangerous Dangerous in a way that history and memory is becoming weaponized more for the sake of internal politics than informing the international relations themselves. And that's my conclusion from the last 30 years of observing closely the Polish-Israeli diplomatic relations. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much. There are already several questions in the chat, so just a reminder, you're welcome to, for those who are listening online, um, to contribute to that and also to members of the audience here um, and use the 20 minutes that you now still have whilst Jen Wang is going to give us his comments. Um, <coughs> Professor Wang is director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies um, and he has a professorship at the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. I'm not exactly sure where I have to look at, but probably there. Um, his research focuses on kind of three areas that are very closely interrelated and perfectly prepare him to give the comments just now. One focus being on identity-based conflicts, questions of nationalism and the politics of historical memory. A second, that's the geographical emphasis being on peace and conflict management in East Asia. And the third one, the nexus between foreign and domestic linkage in Chinese politics. And he's written a good deal of what he has researched on that topic in a book um, entitled Never Forget National Humiliation, Historical Memory in Chinese Politics and Foreign Relations. And we're very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts and bringing the five papers all together. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. We can see you and hopefully hear you. Okay, um, good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good morning. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind uh, invitation and uh, introduction. Uh, first, my apology. I supposed to be in uh, Poland to attend this meeting in person. Uh, but I'm currently in Beijing. I visited Beijing after this is actually the, uh, uh, the first time the three years because of the COVID. And you know about the China's uh, COVID control policy. So if I leave Beijing, I have to go back to Beijing for another 10 days of quarantine. So that makes me not be able to join you in person. So I, I really sorry for that. 
Um, I listened to this five excellent presentation. Uh, I believe I have your sympathy because I need to comment this uh, very rich, very well researched studies, five of them. So, um, uh, so I would just go one by one. I would try to, because I know it's boring to listening to someone speaking online. And I believe our in-person audience must have a lot of questions to ask. Um, okay, so our first presentation uh, by Dr. Uh, Wallis Wisk uh, on the uh, cross-border politics of memory. I think it's very interesting. And uh, um, you mentioned about the border, um, you know, border town. And it's make me to think about myself because my hometown, my home province is also a border province between China and Vietnam. And I currently have a student from Whitlam. Um, and she's also from the border province of Whitlam, sharing border with China. So we are actually very close to each other. And you're probably knowing about that between China and Vietnam, there were 10 years war just uh, from late 1970s to late 1980s. Uh, the border area suffered a lot of the war. So we talked about the war. So your presentation make me to think about the, my own situation and with the uh, students from Whitlam. Um, and you got a lot of very interesting discussions and uh, your paper is based on a uh, quite solid uh, literature review of, about the border and the politics of memory. Um, if I could give any suggestions, um, I, I don't want to pretend to trying to, maybe I can give you very good uh, recommendation just by listening to your 20 minutes presentation and reading your paper. Um, but I just think maybe besides you trying to put your presentation in the framework of cross-cultural communication, but I think besides the, this framework, maybe another framework might be useful is social identity theory. Or some of the work like a Sarah Cope of George Mason University uh, regarding about narrative and conflict might be useful. The reason I mentioned identity is that I think people living in the border areas very often they are facing a complicated situation is that they are familiar with the culture of both sides. And they have also a lot of intermarriages between these two countries. They suffered the conflict. Sometimes they have no choice being involved of a conflict between the two countries of the domestic politics. Um, but they sometimes facing the identity issues, um, like they have to facing, uh, they have to choose inside, or they um, they also facing the choice of what is the right narrative. Uh, about what happened in the past, just like the conversation I conducted with my student from Vietnam. Uh, she told me that, of course, that in the border areas, they, this area suffered a lot of this war. So they have a lot of the domestic anti-China sentiments. But at the same time, this is also the border area they benefit a lot of the reopening of the board and the trade and the China economic opening up and the reform and the China's rise, um, you yeah. know. So they benefit a lot of these uh, trade wars, the board war, uh, the board trades uh, between the two countries. So uh, and also the a lot of intermarriages. Um, so that makes a kind of like a, a identity um, difficulties for them to very often when they trying to uh, discussing about the past war, like I mentioned, the 10 years war. Um, so I just think that um, the framework of um, identity, social identity theory might also provide some useful uh, framework for you. Um, and also I think a question I might ask is that um, 
like I mentioned, your paper is based on very solid literature. Review. What will be the next step? Do you want to develop into a book project or general article? Um, I think it's very interesting and it's um, it's very good concept uh, for us to discuss about people in the board and especially suffering the past conflict and when they are facing the current situation and they are also at the board of the dialogue and reconciliation. So this is really an excellent research. I'm very interested in uh, you know, reading your future uh, research on this topic. Um, the second paper by Mr. Roguleski and um, uh, first I I really want to say, um, you know, our, my respect and praise of the work of your organization has been work has been doing. I think it's really great, um, and it make me to think about also because I'm from East Asia. Um, I think in East Asia we should also need to have. Uh, organization like a European network of remembrance and solidarity. solidarity. Uh, but we lack of this kind of organization. I believe you all know that um, historic memory issue is a, until now, after so many years, after over 70 years of the war, the end of the war is still a core issue of the international relation in East Asia. And we are still, um, you know, uh, lack of a good reconciliation like between China and Japan, between Japan and South Korea. So it's a still core issue and we lack of uh, organization trying to promoting dialogue, research, uh, like your organization, like your leadership uh, for putting this together. Um, and we talks about, this panel talks about actors I think your organization is a very good actor um, because um, I, uh, I, actually I think five of your presentation, you mentioned the different actors in terms of politics of memory. But uh, I think the organization like the European Network Remembers and Solidarity is also a very important actor facilitating dialogue over memory issues. And our scholars, like each of you, you are also an actor uh, because we, our research, our uh, work, helping people to rethink, to reflect about past conflict. And we are also can play a very important role of uh, facilitating the dialogues between society and at least helping the, um, you know, the the countries, the societies suffering the past conflict to have a better understanding about each other's perspectives. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I just really want to um, congratulate you on uh, the great work, including this, um, you know, organizing this conference. And uh, for my organization, uh, we are really honored and pleased to work with you to uh, co-sponsor this conference. It's, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, the third presentation by Dr. Danny, um, it's, um, yeah, it's on the 1956 revolution. Um, it's uh, yeah, very interesting. And uh, you know what? You make me to think about uh, in 1970s, Ni early, uh, yeah, 1970s or late 1960s. Uh, in China, there's a large number of audience, people listening to Voice of America. Um, at that time, you talked about the Iron Curtain and how people listening Radio Free Europe. But uh, um, uh, during that period of time that uh, I still remember my father is trying to put her ears on the uh, radio, trying to listen, hardly trying to to listen the voice of America because very often the quality of voice is very bad um, and played a very important role for people in China to understand the information, for, to know the information from outside. Um, um, 
and it's uh, it's became a great enemy of the region, like you mentioned about the uh, radio free Europe. Uh, and you talks about very interesting uh, about the true memory and how the regime trying to making people to you know to know what is the right memory, what is the, is the official narrative. Um, and also, uh, you mentioned about this actually uh, a memory community was created by the radio. So it's the same thing, like that memory community of the Voice of America was created. Um, I, uh, I think the question I want to ask you is that I'm curious about uh, whether the Radio Free Europe still, you know, active or what, how their current work, because that makes me to think about Voice of America. Um, several years ago, I very often being invited by Voice of America to, to make comments, to attend their programs. But uh, I found that uh, nowadays that uh, um, their influence in China all becomes much lower compared with uh, uh, 1960s, 1970s. And also very often that uh, uh, being a little bit controversy, and maybe I should say that uh, for today. And uh, I didn't really follow up the reason behind that, uh, but I just was curious about the, what's the situation about Radio Free Europe. Uh, maybe another, just a, a recommendation for you is that um, I think you, you wrote a very good paper. Um, I remember um, there's also articles uh, regarding about the memory of the voice of Marek. Uh, I remember I, I, I quickly, uh, I didn't really read, but I remember I, 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 uh, I, uh, there's several of these kind of articles. Maybe you can find these articles and it, because it's, it has some very similar discussion like your article. So maybe you can uh, take a reference of the, the seminar publication, even it's not about the Radio Free Europe, but uh, very similar. Yeah, thank you. Um, our fourth paper, uh, it's about post-war recon uh, reconstruction. You talked about very interesting discussion about urban space as mediator of memory. And I like the photos you are showing and uh, the city wall, uh, very interesting uh, research. And particularly you mentioned you have a lot of discussion about the 1999 bombing of um, uh, the, the NATO bombing. Um, I just want to let you know that actually I, uh, the book I published, uh, the Never Forget National Humiliation, I have a chapter actually discussed about the bombing of Chinese embassy in the same bombing, uh, 1999. And I believe you know that uh, that bombing actually generated a major anti-US protest in China, in Beijing, and the angry students, angry young people actually attacked the, attacked the US embassy and damaged the embassy badly. And that created a huge diplomatic crisis between China and the US. So my book actually discussed about that case. And uh, um, I know that I didn't follow up, but I know that uh, 10 years after the bombing, uh, the new Chinese embassy was, was rebuilt. And also that um, I, I should follow up that, but uh, I, I remember that Chinese president visited the, the site of the, 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 uh, the, the old embassy and decided to use the site to build a Chinese culture center uh, in the same location. Uh, so, um, I think this is also a very interesting case study because uh, following, you know, um, 
I believe you all know that in recent several years that the, the US-China relations encountered major difficulties and worsening and sliding into a full confrontation. So recently, I remember the Chinese delegation, the senior official delegations, they visit the old um, you know, embassy sites to showing respect, but which is actually, they didn't do that during the, uh, you know, when the US-China relation was much better. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I think I really interested in your research. Maybe you can consider, or maybe two of us can co author an article about the, the embassy site, um, you know, the same bombing, yeah. It's, uh, I think it's also a very good, uh, very interesting case study about memory and international relations. Yeah. Um, okay, so our uh, last presentation, um, I'm sorry, I just, because I, I didn't uh, li listen in the entire presentation because I logged in and logged out. I'm not sure whether I should be at the audience, um, you know, um, uh, or logging as the, as, the, as the participant or speaker. <laughs> so I was a little bit confused whether you can see me or whether you can hear me as a commentator. Uh, but I think it's very, also very interesting. Um, um, you talk about the, um, uh, the name change and the flight um, and how this related with internal politics. Um, so we know that the memory sites, like the concentration camp, is always highly symbolic. Uh, and so that can become attention um, of the media, also attention of the domestic politics. And this also makes me to think, uh, you know, for example, the Yasukuri Shine, the, the Japanese temple, and it also becomes a very symbolic between China and Japan. Every time when the bilateral relation becomes, um, you know, there's tension between the two countries or every time when the Japanese politicians visit or show respect to the Yasukuri Shine, it's always generating some diplomatic debates or, or tensions between China and uh, Japan and between Japan and South Korea. So, um, the, uh, the 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 relationship between the, um, the the major memory sites and how that related with domestic narrative and how the you know how can we uh, improve like I agree with you the important is to have the dialogue and uh, I think the scholars can play very just like five of you can um, play very positive role to helping the different societies to have the, to serving as the actor or mediator of the memories to helping the different societies, especially the past, the societies, they suffering the past conflict and haven't realized a good reconciliation to help this kind of society and the people to have a good, um, the dialogue and the better understanding about each other's perspectives. Uh, uh, I think I will stop here. I know that uh, we must have a lot of uh, questions from the audience. And thank you again for the excellent research. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. <laughs> and before I give the panel the chance to respond, um, and you all in the room can speak to the panelists after over coffee as well. There are several questions in the chat, and I would like to give the online participants the opportunity to be part of the discussion. So first, um, we've got a question from Alina Pfoser to you, Christoph. Um, a question on the relationship between center and periphery in cross-border politics. Um, she writes, you outlined how actors in the borderlands could shape local memory initiatives, but are there some examples of how these initiatives had a wider resonance and shaped national understandings of the past? 
This is one of the assumptions of border studies, that borderlands can also act as laboratories for the creation of identities and memories. Is this something you find in your case is the question for you. Um, then, Gruya, you get a question from Heidi also through the chat. It seems memorialization architecture post-conflict reconstruction has been used to claim not only physical territory, but memory territory of a broken city, which was unable to refuse international assistance. However, this assistance seems to be contingent on incorporating the memory preferences of the assisting nation, a sort of architectural bribery, one could say. Do you feel this has a negative impact on the overarching memory of a city or state or country in creating, or does it create a kind of memory confusion? And then we've got Davide Denti uh, with a question for Tomas um, related to the commemorative flights that you were talking about over Auschwitz. Um, do you see this as a reflection of Israel's foundational political myth of the new strong Israeli Jew versus the weak diaspora Jew? So you can think about what you're going to answer to that. Um, and since you got the first question and comments, I would pass the word on to you for, if possible, sharp and brief remarks that we can have a round of questions in the room. Thank you. Does it work? Is it working? Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that uh, question. Uh, in my research, I have not observed uh, that cross-border politics of memory could influence uh, national level of uh, politics of memory. And I think the reason is that uh, this local politics of memory is founded on the memory of place, whereas politics of memory at the national level is based on the idea of nation, ethnicity. Uh, we have examples at the Polish-German borderlands where we have uh, examples of, uh, for example, observing uh, German heritage, such as, uh, uh, for example, commemoration of German residents of the city, uh, in former German residents of the city, whereas uh, at the national level it would be impossible, simply because uh, at the local level we have this memory of place, uh, and at the national level there is the memory of nation ethnicity, which is very, in my opinion, close for uh, for. Uh, foreign uh, influences. Thank you. You can ask, Rafael, you can answer as well to the, to the comments if you want to. Do you want to react to what um, Jen was saying? I, I can say only thank you very much for, <laughs> for these nice words, but, but, but nothing more. Thank you. First of all, thank you. Is it working? I seem to have an effect on, 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 on gadgets today. So, um, so first of all, to the discussion, thank you so much. Uh, actually, I didn't hear in the, in the presentation, I decided I didn't talk too much about the Belgrade um, situation, which is described in the paper quite, quite a lot. And I think the Chinese embassy indeed is, is a very interesting um, uh, case. And it, again, the, the position of, of, of Serbia in this geopolitical Entanglements is, is very interesting, and I'll be thrilled to actually uh, talk more about this uh, the possibility of an article. That, that sounds wonderful. And uh, now, with the, um, regards to the question about whether I, val I value as negative this um, uh, these interventions, I would I would say first of all I would give the vo voice to the to the um, to the residents to the to the to the, uh, to the local who, um, as I alluded, they. There's, there's a sense of disgruntlement, for instance, when the Saudis come and change the Balkan chromatically rich mosque into something white, because that's the way they, they practice Islam. People were angry from the professionals to the, uh, to the people. To, but um, these forms of erasure, but also forms of confusion, as you, as, uh, you put it in the question. There's, the EU is talking about cosmopolitanism, while others are boosting particular religious identities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's, there's a lot of clashes. But actually, I didn't do it in this paper. But actually, um, it just—it's an article that just uh, came came out this month in the uh, Journal of Intervention and State Building, which is—it's um, a special issue on space for peace. And I talk about the reactions in Sarajevo, local reactions to to all the things that are happening from uh, from um, from the exterior, and how there's a particular model of architectural action which connects to memory, which I call syncretic placemaking. 
how actually local architects say, okay, let's 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 uh, let's have the voice coming from uh, from within, and to actually express how we want the city to be. So it's a form of resistance to all these forms of capital, but also these forms of 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 of, dip, of uh, diplomacy that has an impact on the city. So maybe that that could be an interesting uh, um, take. And uh, to give a Maybe a final example, uh, Lebewus Woods was this famous American architect who came at the end of the war in, in Sarajevo and suggested that the, um, the city cannot just be rebuilt. Uh, he said um, a reconstruction like in Warsaw would be a mistake uh, because one needs to see the pain. And so he suggested that every building will have a small scar, a scab he called it, in which every building will show, will be a, mo a monument of destruction and, and people reacted quite negatively from, from architects to, again, to, lo to, to, to local residents. But in this case, it was a negotiation. It was, it was a discussion, and eventually nothing happened. While in the others, money comes with an agenda, and things change without any consultation in the city. So that's why I think it's important to give voice to the, to the local. The local is never innocent. We, we should not idealize the local. But in this case, looking at resistance, it's important uh, in this uh, dialogue between the exterior, the external and the, and the internal. Uh, thank you very much for the question about, I just resonate a question, I hope I understand it correctly, uh, whether this memorial flight of Auschwitz is uh, kind of resonating the myth of a strong Israeli, a Sabra. Uh, of course it does. <sighs> That's the short answer. The, a little bit longer answer is, uh, I've been looking at the Israeli identity for the last 20 years and writing about it. Uh, for the needs of my paper, uh, I enumerated only four basic pillars, uh, which in my opinion are constituting the contemporary Israel identity. And uh, one of them is Zionism and the foundation of a state. Uh, another one is Judaism, still, surprisingly. Uh, the third one is the memory of the Holocaust. And the fourth one is the M Middle East conflict. And uh, in my opinion, those are the four pillars of contemporary Israeli identity today. Um, why this uh, memorial flight was so important and so formative for identity building and so much telling? Well, it's been inscribed in a line of historical events and we can start enumerating those events 3,000 years ago, uh, which is very much talking to the very emotional aspects of being Jewish and being Israeli, historically. Uh, and uh, that's why this was just another uh, event organized politically by the state in order to inscribe itself uh, in the environment of Auschwitz, which is strongly controversial for the Israeli politics of identity. Uh, for example, for the fact that we are very good in constructing identities based on heroism. There was a question actually in the first panel about heroism and constructing identities. We have a lot of cultural patterns of constructing memory based on heroism. But the question is, do we have a pattern of constructing identity on victimhood? It's only 20th century that we started to talk about constructing our memories on victimhood. And as we are sitting here in Warsaw, and you might be wandering through the city, and you might be wandering into the Warsaw Getze Uprising Monument from 1947, built by Nathan Rappaport, I would ask you not so much to focus on the front part of the monument, which is kind of expected what it is to be. Go to the back part and see what is on the back part, and how an architect because Rappaport was an architect, is trying to actually interweave the victimhood as early as in 1947 into the story of what happened here during the war. And by the way, by 1947, the historiography of the event is non-existent. Uh, so yes, my answer is yes. Uh, apparently, it's just another um, stage in constructing the the Israeli identity, and why has it happened? 
Uh, and don't understand me wrong, I'm not um, only criticizing it, and I'm not very negative about this event happening. Uh, I think the reason why this particular thing happened and was not uh, consulted with the Polish side or international forums uh, is the fact that probably, and that's something controversial which I'm going to say, but probably it's a good moment for the afternoon panel, uh, probably uh, there has never been a proper re-evaluation of Zionism as such. There has never been a proper re-evaluation of uh, uh, Zionism as a state ideology, which was absolutely fundamental uh, at a certain stage of Jewish history. But uh, in order to keep it fundamental, in my opinion, it has to be re-evaluated. But that's a different conversation. Okay, thank you very much. Now, open to the audience. I already have three hands. Okay, so we're going to have one big round of questions and then back to the panel and then Gabo, you can... Yeah. Oh, and then you add your responses there. I thought you were kind of skipping as you passed on the mic. So I'll take the, the questions as I saw them. First gentleman, the gray jumper. Sorry for the jumper, it's a bit cold. <laughs> we can hear you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is David Wood from Seton Hall University again. Uh, again, Zheng Wang, good to see you. I hope you're well. Um, I, I'd want to ask questions for everyone, but I won't. So I'll keep myself, I'll restrict myself. because These were you know, very, very strong presentations, I think. Um, so I'd actually, uh, Gria, I'd like to, to start w with you and this, this idea of international intent and impact within, within support for reconstruction. And what I would like to to see if it's possible within the, your fuller paper when you elaborated, if you could also take that model and apply it to places further from Europe. So I've actually been involved in mediating reconstruction in the Middle East, um, re reconstruction works. And there's an additional element there that I think is really interesting, which is, is signaling legitimacy. Who is the legitimate authority? So if you look at the stabilization work done in Iraq after um, the defeat of ISIL, then there was an attempt to reinforce trust in the national government through rapid reconstruction done under UN development. And then the work that I was involved in in, in Libya was very politicized in the end because there was an attempt to reinforce trust in the internationally recognized government in Tripoli through, again, reconstruction. So I'd like you to, to see if you could give me some thoughts on that now, but then also over time that would be good. And then an additional question is, as you're looking at these physical reconstructions, do you also look at how um, social reconstruction occurs in parallel? So what are the opportunities in planning for reconstruction to give people voice and then maintaining relationships afterwards? And I will stop myself there because I actually have many more questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Bartosz, you're next. Thanks so much. Um, I have one short remark for uh, Krzysztof Wasilewski, namely uh, the, the problematic place that you mentioned, the, Pol the, the monument for the uh, Polish victims. It, it, the, the whole story is a little more complicated from the very name of it, because the name is slightly different, and that also explains why it is so difficult. Because um, there are, in fact, few names, and they still haven't decided yet which one will be the actual, actual name. One is Poland Denkmal, so simply the Pol Polish monument. The other is Ort des Erinnerns und der Begegnung mit Polen, which means that it's like a place of remembrance and meeting with Poland. And if we translate the third name that into English, it should be monument for the victims from Poland. And it's important because it's not about Poles as such, but different nationalities from Poland. And it's so important for them because um, it's not just a, a bilateral monument, it can influence also their, um, the German uh, relations with many other countries which also had victims. And now they do not want to make this special case for Poles because then they would open new topics with many dozens of other countries. So that's one of the core reasons why it takes so so long. Thank you. Burkhard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one question to Gabor. Um, if we look like to the Hungarian revolution of 1956, so the, the perils then to the war in the Ukrainian, are quite obvious um, if you take into account 
and that Soviet troops moved in without uh, or was neglecting any international law. And in these days, so in October, we have the 66th anniversary of the Hungarian Revolution. Uh, can you tell us a bit how in those days are commemorate this anniversary under the reg regard of the circumstances in the neighboring country? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And then there were two questions over here. Yes, the blue shirt. That is blue. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, in respect of uh, Thomas's presentation, I think I'll speak to him on the break. Um, in, so, just one question to uh, Gura. You said at the end, I think, that reconstruction is a symbol in, sim symbolic of, of violence. And I was wondering if you have any examples where the opposing state objected to the reconstruction. Because I think, or the, the state that caused the damage. Because I would, I would say it's very difficult for anyone to object to, to reconstruction efforts, even if they're tied with all sorts of conditions. So I was wondering if this really achieves the goal of the state that comes in and, and wants to reconstruct. Thank you. And then there was one more question on the left-hand side. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Eric Langenbacher from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. I have a ton of questions for Gruya, but I guess we can talk later. But in particular, I want to know why Germany didn't reconstruct compared to Poland, and also why the heck they're reconstructing things 70 years later, like the Schloss in Berlin and other, other things. But that's for a different conversation. But for Raphael, Raphael um, so I thought the history that you provided of the um, ENRS is really kind of fascinating, and also how one of the original motivations was to outmaneuver Erika Steinbach and her Centrum gegen Vertreibung, right? Um, you no doubt know that the outcome of that initiative um, is now a physical space in Berlin. It's what the Stiftung Flugvertreibung und Versöhnung, um, which I visited when I was there um, last year. So I'm just wondering what your reactions are to that particular initiative and whether ENRS is working with that um, uh, uh, institution in any way. Okay, any other questions from the audience members? Perfect, I would have one quick question for you, Gabor. Um, and that is about the, I mean, fascinating set of sources. Do we know anything about the people who actually called? I mean, calling a foreign radio station kind of is a self-selection, right, process going on. Not everyone will leave a message on the answering phone or get in touch with them anyway. Um, do we know anything about the socio-biographical conditions? I mean, what is the source type, what are the scope conditions, therefore, of the study um, that you're undertaking? I would like to hear a few words on that. Um, and then, as this is the last round, I'd simply suggest we go in inverse order, since, Tomas, you still have the microphone. Do you want to start, and then we move up, and Gabor has double the speaking time. No, if you don't want, then pass on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> that was your chance. So thank you for the question. So first, with the um, uh, intent and impact, who is legitimate? This key, uh, the key aspect is trust. Indeed, you 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 emphasize it, emphasize it rightly. Uh, rightly, so trust is the key in reconstruction, and, and you can see this in uh, all these strategies in the way that uh, reconstruction has been packaged as development plus trust. So it's urban development or, or institutional development, but trust is the key. And it's not only the West that's doing that. So it's, it's interesting if uh, the example I was giving of, the, uh, of Iran's involvement after the 2006 uh, July war in, uh, in, in, um, in Lebanon, basically Iran is first assisted with, um, with Dakhye, with the south of Beirut, but also then went and, uh, and rebuilt strategically small villages of the, of the Orthodox Christians, of the Maronites, and said, uh, look, we, I am, we are really, uh, we are interested in Lebanon holistically, we, we, you should trust us. So there, there was even this, this, this discussion of, of trust. So instilling trust is, um, is, is, is important in the way that reconstruction is, is narrated. And the question is, who is actually doing things? So for instance, if you look at uh, at, at, uh, at Syria's re uh, reconstruction. So who are the actors and, do, and to what extent, if you want to help now recon uh, the reconstruction efforts, you actually endorse the regime. And, and so this is actually, this is quite com complicated in, into, uh, into this. With the question of social planning, uh, of course, it's always, they go hand in hand. And this is actually, um, uh, so um, there is, 
there is a, there's quite a, a relationship, and it's very important to, to look at forms of including the, the local. However, there's also this, this, que this question of to what extent is the bottom up a silver bullet? And there was a, a, there was a great piece by, the, uh, by Hillhurst who argued that basically we see so much attention from the World Bank to other, association, uh, other organizations to deal with the bottom up that somehow what you, you end up doing is inf uh, reinforcing the power dynamics that existed that actually created conflict giving warlords the power of, over reconstruction. So this is actually, this is one, one issue here among many others. Reconstruction being uh, symbolic and uh, uh, opposing states doing reconstruction. So I, the first thing that came to my mind was Chechnya. It's interesting how, how, how Chechnya as part, part of Russia was rebuilt by, uh, by the, with the ones who actually destroyed it and it was rebuilt in a way to, to sustain a totally new Chechen society, a very uh, gleaming listening, uh, but completely controlled by, by, the, by the country that, that, that rebuilt it. So it's a very interesting connection there in, the, in, the, in the, um, the glitzy urban environment and actually the way that Chechen has, has been run since, since the conflicts. And there are, many, yeah, there are many other ideas, but we can continue in the, in the, um, the break. Yeah, thank you. I have also obligations from the previous round, uh, so I start uh, with uh, thanking for Professor Zhang Wang for his recommendations and uh, comments. Uh, I will certainly check these articles about Voice of America. Uh, thank you for this. And uh, in my answer now, I should check. I should address the the question of the cur current situation of Radio Free Europe, as I understood well. Um, as far as I know, uh, Radio Free Europe uh, is still operating in Eastern countries, uh, but considering the Hungarian desk, uh, it was closed in the, at the beginning of the 1990s, um, according to the fact that uh, it was believed that after the democratic changes, there is no need to run such a very expensive uh, foreign radio station because the started to speak about Hungarian media and I was censored already. <laughs> That's strange. So that there is no need to uh, there is no need to run such an expensive radio station and the Hungarian democratic media will uh, of course uh, uh, fulfill this uh, this role uh, which was fulfilled previously by the by the radio. Uh, but few years ago uh, Radio Free Europe uh, Written back to Hungary, not as a radio, but as an online platform, which uh, does not want to uh, um, be the uh, want to be the alternative of of other uh, other online media platform, uh, not offering uh, general and entire media coverage about world politics and Hungarian politics and so on, but offering uh, very deep um, reports about uh, particular questions. Uh, so this is, or th this is already a kind of uh, media platform and what is also important that it still exists as a, as, a, as a heritage, right? If you go to the Open Society Archives, uh, which is located in Budapest, uh, you can read uh, tens of thousands of documents uh, produced by the Radio Free Europe, press clippings, uh, survey reports, um, also completed with uh, uh, with some is that publication and so on. So this is a very rich uh, archival material, uh, which is accessible now in Budapest and previously belonged to the Radio Free Europe. So it uh, uh, it still exists in this in this form. <coughs> uh, considering uh, the question of Burkhardt commemorations of 1956, uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I can tell you more in the coffee break, just uh, very, very brief, briefly. I have the impression that the uh, general memory of 1956, and this is a more general uh, process, which, uh, which is lasting already for many years, is fading away. Um, so uh, we don't see that kind of, um, don't see it as a, as, as a very strong social memory. It's really fading away. And from a very heterogeneous uh, picture of the revolution, it started to become a very one-dimensional di one uh, picture. Um, I don't know how, f how much are you familiar with the history of the Hungarian Revolution, uh, 
but in the revolution uh, there were many actors, many social groups which took part, including students, writers, workers, and so on. Now, a uh, few years before, uh, the, the Hungarian government wanted to remember only the street fighters. Now, uh, this has to be changed, of course, <laughs> due, to the, due to the current uh, situation in, in, in Ukraine. Um, uh, what is important that this year uh, Viktor Orban uh, and the Fidesz, the main party, didn't organize um, a main commemoration uh, which was used to organize in previous years. He went to the countryside and um, opened a new um, uh, cultural center uh, called after Mincenti. Um, so that shows how, um, how uh, again, the, the memory is, is fading away. Um, and what is also um, important that uh, now he tries to change uh, the memory of the revolution, saying that sometimes we have to fight against military forces, uh, but sometimes against uh, sanctions imposed uh, by Brussels. Uh, so in this um, in this word word view, I don't think that uh, that uh, the real heritage and the real memory of 1956 is still exist, unfortunately. And the third question the, uh, about the sources of the answering machine, uh, these are very complex sources. Um, just very briefly, um, uh, of course, it is, it is really hard to identify the people uh, who are behind these voices. We have the transcripts, so we don't have access to the, to the voice itself. Uh, and usually uh, these people uh, didn't introduce themselves. Sometimes it happened if somebody called from a Western country, an emigre hum Hungarian, um, then we know that he's from, I don't know, Bern, for example, or uh, from somewhere else. But if, if someone called the Radio Free Europe's an answering machine uh, from the Eastern Bloc, he usually used the nickname. So that's why it's really hard to identify these voices. But we know uh, that uh, basically intellectuals and dissidents uh, called uh, um, the answering machine. And I can tell you more in the coffee break. Thank you very much. Uh, before I mm, will answer your question, uh, I will come back to, uh, to Professor Wang. Uh, you said that uh, it would be good to have similar institution in Asia. Uh, we are, of course, open to share our experiences with you and any interested institutions um, in building such similar um, network. But uh, as I said in my, in my speech, it is, co it is absolutely necessary to have uh, um, the willingness uh, from from all sides to to, to, to to build such network. It can't be uh, built against someone. This is quite comfortable situation, but 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 uh, I don't see the possibility to build such network against the states, for example. Uh, to your question, thank you very much for that. I didn't have enough time and space to uh, to say something about that. Mm, uh, I saw this this new exhibition, actually two exhibitions um, in in that house, um, and uh, mm, I have the feeling that uh, it was worth to. Uh, uh, to make a huge discussion uh, 10 years ago uh, if we have such a good, uh, interesting um, exhibition now. Completely different from the plans uh, and uh, um, very complex, very interesting. Um, uh, the, I, I think it's enough uh, now f uh, um, to say about the exhibition, it is worth to go to Berlin and see this exhibition. Um, another uh, question is if we 
uh, are cooperating with the mm, with with this institution. We are cooperating with this institution uh, mm, now. Uh, we are preparing the common conference about mm, uh, misuse uh, or misusing of uh, of the history in a, mm, and using history as a weapon. Um, of course, in connection to to mm, mainly to 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 using of history uh, mm, by Russian regime now, mm, it will take place probably at the beginning of February next year. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, pointing out the the problem with the name itself because this is the key question about monuments, what they should commemorate, and you are right, it hasn't been decided whether they should co the, the monument should commemorate Poles, peoples of pre-war Poland, or the Slavic people in general. So uh, even this first step of uh, the dialogue hasn't been done yet. And uh, But from my point of view, why I included this case study uh, in my research, in my presentation, was that it illustrates uh, the limitations of central authorities in uh, foreign uh, politics of memory because uh, it shows clearly that the, the, the central government has very little, is not a dominating power in this discourse on, on, on international aspect of collective uh, memory and, uh, and uh, it is uh, just take a look at uh, try to answer question why uh, those cross-border initiatives are so successful, whereas these initiatives made by a central government are not. Uh, it's because uh, both sides at the central uh, at the central level, both sides lack the, the the ability to. They haven't established the, the dialogue yet. When we look at it from the perspective of cross-cultural communication, whereas at the uh, border, borderland level, at the local level, uh, this communication has been taking place for much longer time and it's on a different level of advancement of communication than the level of the central government, at least from the perspective of, uh, from the perspective of cross cultural communication. Thank you. All right, I think it's the sign of a successful panel if we could go on for another 20 minutes, but that we are going to clash then with the next panel. Therefore, I'd like to thank the participants that joined us online and those in the room for the excellent questions, Professor Wang for the great comments and all five speakers for wonderful papers. Um, there's a 10-minute break and let's just thank the panel before we meet again. <laughs>